maybe Irish guy. And can you imagine? Okay, just imagine if we all judge managers solely by their first signing in the job. Let's, we all do it. Uh, okay, a new manager comes through the door and you stare at them. Analyzing their first sighting, judging them solely on that. And that so many of these top coaches, buckling under the pressure and nerves of having to get it right. Oh, they often get it so wrong. So today I am going to rank from worst to best every Premier League club based on their current manager's first signing for them. I mean, it's only 19 though, because you know, Santo hasn't signed anyone from Forest yet. Yeah, how ironic. The Nottingham Forest manager hasn't made any signings. Right, let's go. 19th, Crystal Palace, Erdal Rakip. For Roy Hodgson's first signing in the job, we have to go all the way back to January 2018. Back when that awful Despacito song had driven us all to the point of shoving dog food in our ears. But yeah, for a man of Hodgson's experience, someone who's bought about 100 players in his life, you would have expected him to be pretty clever at picking buys now. I mean, this wasn't his first rodeo. On the contrary, this man who back then was probably beginning to struggle with mastering the use of toilet paper on his own. Ah, it's just a quiet way for saying he probably put his pants. Oh yeah, he replaces Frank De Boer in September 2017. Someone who went from Ajax managerial whiz kid, who was sniffing around the Liverpool and Tottenham job 10 years ago, to um, a man who was only given a combined 48 games in charge of Inter Milan, Crystal Palace, Netherlands and Al Jazeera. I mean, it made his 55 game stint in the MLS feel like a saga longer than the Harry Potter film but Roy comes in and wraps up a January deal for 21 year old Swedish midfielder Erdal Rakim arriving from Benfica's bench. He didn't play a single match. He was more of an outcast at the palace than Prince Andrew. He must have been terrible in training. He must have shown the work rate of a hungover cookie monster. Because again, ask any palace fan now about Erdal Rakim and they'd probably think you were talking about some type of Latvian soup. I mean, who is Rakim? Oh, by the way, if you're here, hit subscribe. Trying to get to 190,000 subscribers. That would be incredible. If we could do that, this week, it would blow my mind. Anyway, Absolute Legends, back into the video. 18th, Liverpool, Marco Grouch. Yeah. If you're a judging manager solely based on their first signings in the job, Jurgen Klopp would look like a complete buffoon who you wouldn't even trust to buy you food. You'd assume this deranged lunatic would just come back with a bunch of vegetables he'd rob from a homeless bloke. I mean, he'd hand you a banana that has clearly been dipped in a puddle of earwax. But anyway, the first signing of this Klopp era is Marco Grouch. Yes, I know nowadays that name means nothing to you. It's got all the aura and prestige of a homeless teddy bear with fur that looks like it's just being pooed on by a dog. But back in 2016, this was an exciting 20 year old Red Star Belgrade wonder kids who've been linked with Inter Milan, Juventus, Chelsea, PSG, Manchester United, and AC Milan. Apparently, the only reason he didn't end up with Stamford Bridge is because his big admirer, Josie Mourinho, was sacked. He looked like a £5 million coup at Anfield in January 2016. Remember when he scored in a preseason friendly against Huddersfield? He looked like a dream signing. Now, in the end, he was about as pointless as Melissa McCarthy's treadmill. But yeah, 16 Liverpool cameos. He never started a single match outside of the League Cup. His only goal came against Lincoln City, where there were no fans allowed in the ground. I'm sorry, but for the extreme hype attached to this kid, he really was an awful letdown. To be fair though, he since moved to Porto and done pretty well out there. So he's clearly not not a complete sausage pot. 17th Brighton Yasin Ayari. Yeah, here we have Roberto De Zerbi's first signing. And yes, it is delightfully hipster. As everybody would expect, in January of last year, 19-year-old Swedish midfielder Yasin Ayari was snapped up from AIK Football, a Swedish team who played in a stadium called the Friends Arena. Uh, what, do they have a statue of David Schwimmer outside the ground? But anyway, Ayari is clearly one for the future. He's only played three games for the Seagulls, was loaned to Coventry in August, and now Blackburn Rovers this month. He's already a full Swedish international, so I assume that he's gonna be good, but so far, could be anything. 16 Fulham. Paolo Gazzaniga. Paolo Gazzaniga has had a career full of English disrespect. He took the embarrassing, sobering, humbling reality of having to leave Valencia's academy for Gillingham in 2011. It's a bit like if KSI lost all his brand deals and was now forced to go sweep the floors in Iceland, just mopping up turkey dinosaur smelling toddler puke. Gazzaniga has been largely ignored by Southampton, Tottenham and Fulham. Sitting on so many benches, he must surely have hemorrhoids in his bum. This is an Argentina international goalkeeper who, yeah, was snapped up by Marco Silva on a two-year deal in July 2021. He played 30 games for Fulham in the Championship and to be fair, did okay, only losing four. Although to be fair, after playing second field to Marek Rodak, for most of their title winning campaign, he gets given a start in their final match of the season and is ripped apart 4-0 by Sheffield United. His Fulham stint was miserable, but the joke's on them because guess what? He's currently number one for Girona, sitting top of La Liga. Who's laughing now, Marek? 15th Arsenal, Pablo Mari. Oh, no, 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 no. When Mikel Arteta was first given his Arsenal job, most people assumed he was just an unprepared rookie who was about to be swallowed whole by the pressure. I 
mean, if Arsene Wenger couldn't cope, this man whose entire coaching career was just... Uh, what? Sprinkling the sugar on the Pep's morning porridge? So all eyes were on his first sign. Was he going to raid the Etihad for one of his former players? No. But he did sign a former Man City player, Pablo Mari, who was then a 26-year-old Flamengo centre-back. 14 million pounds he cost in January 2020. The plan was to have both he and David Luiz forming a saucy Brazilian centre-half herring that was easier on the eyes than the god Mona Lisa. Nah. Uh, Mari was plagued by injuries. To be fair, his record in an Arsenal shirt wasn't terrible. He played 22 times, 13 wins, 6 defeats, 2 draws. But I'm sorry, his lasting legacy is, yeah, playing every minute of both legs in that semi-final bottle jump defeat to Villarreal in the Europa League, where Unai Emery was able to humiliate his former club. Look, Mari wasn't an awful player, but he had all the longevity of a snowman in Kenya, and when, yeah, was since loaned to Udinese, sold to Monza, and, yeah, was such a forgettable sign that he could probably walk naked through the streets of North London, and nobody would have a clue who he is. Is to think he was once signed by Guardiola. What? 14th Wolf Santiago Bueno. Gaianela was swiftly chucked into the Wolves' hot seat last August and quickly got to work, making a very un Gary O'Neill signing, buying Uruguayan centre half San Diego Bueno for £8.5 million. I refuse to believe that this ordinary British bloke had a clue who this guy was. Bueno has been pretty average, only given 206 minutes on the Premier League pitch so far. I mean, he did play all 90 minutes as they were booted out of the League Cup at Ipswich. He's not a child, he's halfway to 50, and he is a former Barcelona centre back. This is a grim waste of his time. And what makes it even worse for the poor guy, he left Girona for for this, he's watching his body sitting above every other team in Spain, at the very least hunting down Champions League football, laughing down at the likes of Barcelona and Real Madrid beneath them. He was a first choice starter for that club, and now he's what? Praying for Craig Dawson to snap his collarbone? 13th Burnley Scott Twine. I'm surprised too. I thought that the company's first buy would have been some Belgian bloke from the mountains of Anderlecht. Instead, it was just a 4 million deal for MK Don's attacking midfielder Scott Twine in June 2022. Um, he instantly broke his leg, ruling him out until Christmas. The poor fella only managed 555 minutes of championship football during that title winning season. But to be fair, he did score a sensational free kick winner in an important comeback win over West Brom last January in just a 7 minute cameo. He scored further goals against Rotherham and Cardiff, but that injury clearly ruined him because he since gone alone to Hull in Bristol City. Ah, oh, big shame that. 12th West Ham Joe Mario. When David Moyes first took the West Ham job in 2017, he was seen as an absolute joke. It did not help that his first collection of signings were hideous joke buys. I'm sorry, but West Ham fans had their transfer windows forever spoilt when they once saw Tevez and Mascherano unveiled with Alan Pardew. Everything after that is sort of averaged by comparison. I mean, it's been like getting your son a personal visit from Ronaldo for his birthday present. Yeah, you really think he's gonna be enthused next year when his granny gets him socks? I mean, Moyes asking the Hammers fans get excited by Jordan Hugo and a geriatric raw chicken eating Patrice Evra at the start of 2018. But the first signing through that door was Joe Mario, a 25 year old Portugal international midfielder who signed on over Inter Milan. He did okay. Well, come on, they had an option to buy him for 40 million euros. He did not look like a 40 million player. He played 13 Premier League games, scored twice, won four games, lost five games, and drew four times. A big forgettable meh. When West Ham fans saw this former eggplant misfit scoring a Champions League hat-trick from Benfica this season, they must be more confused than me when I saw the fat kid of Drake and Josh pop up in Oppenheimer. 11th Man United, Tyrell Malassia. Eric Tanak is so lucky that the move for Anthony from Ajax is so drawn out, or he'd have the Dutchman sitting bottom of this list. Yes, even below that anonymous Crystal Palace toothbrush of a player, Tyro Malassia was the first signing through the door. A £13 million buy from Feyenoord. He was one of those players who was gassed up way too much at the start, purely because he was introduced at halftime, with his team 4-0 down away at Brentford. Because the Bees didn't score a single goal while he was on the pitch, oh, the fact that he then kept his spot in defence and played in four straight wins, including victories over Liverpool and Arsenal, the pundits on their telly were talking him up as if this left-back was a genius perfect signing. Yeah, then the complete opposite that happens. He experiences a Brentford reverse. Here he was getting dragged off at half time with the team 4-0 down away at Man City. And he hasn't really been the same since. Look, I mean, he played more games than anyone ever thought. 39 games at left back in your debut season at Manchester United. That is pretty good. You know what? He's been quietly decent. But I was left on the bench for both cup finals last season. He has been injured for all of this campaign. He's probably been an upgrade to Alex Telles as the back of left back. So yeah, it's not an incredible mind-blowing signing. In 10 years time, it'll be about as memorable as Marco Rojo was. Just... Fine. Tenth, Chelsea, Nicholas Jackson. Okay, Chelsea signed both Christopher and Kunku and Nicholas Jackson on the 1st of July. But let's be real. We all know Mauricio Pochettino had about as much to do with the Nkunku deal as I did in making Miley Cyrus famous. No, 
when that deal went through, Pochettino was sitting in his French flat picking popcorn out of his belly button. Anyway, Chelsea tie up a surprising 32 million pound deal for Villarreal striker Nicholas Jackson, someone who has yet to score for Senegal, had zero top flight goals before last season. It was a weird shock buy. And you know what? He's been all right. Eight goals in 23 games for Chelsea. But that hat-trick against nine-man Spurs sort of skews his stats. Because if you just delete that freak match, then suddenly he's stuck on four Premier League goals when he's played virtually every minute of the season. Those are scary Timo Werner-esque numbers. Look, Jackson could well be a flop. So honestly, ugh, I'm going to go with 10th, but ugh, I'm still unsure. But... He is a Chelsea striker who scored a hat-trick against Tottenham. So for that alone, I'll have you as high as 10th. Knight, Everton, Ashley Young. Yeah. Here we have Sean Dyche finally getting his hands on Ashley Young after trying to buy him from Burnley before. Listen, he was a freebie arrival from Aston Villa. He's played 15 games for Everton at right back. I'll, I'll be honest, he has looked pretty poor at times. He was part of a 4 0 embarrassment at his former club Villa, which would have stung more than if he let two bumblebees eat cereal off his tongue. He was also sent off in the Merseyside Derby. He conceded a penalty against another of his former clubs, Man United. He's been part of six wins, two draws, and seven defeats. Considering he turns 39 years old this year, then for his age, I will be nice. For his age, his performances have been pretty good. And he costs less than a chocolate ice cream cone. So, well done, Dyche. I'll put him above Jackson. Eighth, Bournemouth, Justin Clivert. And don't hear you on his first signing, as Bournemouth boss was a £10 million deal for Patrick Clivert's son, Justin. A 24-year-old journeyman who I thought would flop. I called him the Dutch Tom Ince, but... No, he's been, he's been great. Either playing as a left winger or a number 10, he started most matches. Although clearly he has the fitness of that wheezing penguin from Toy Story 2 because he's played 15 times for Bournemouth. Never played more than 73 minutes in any of those games. Honestly, once the clock hits the hour mark, Clyburn is probably scared to make eye contact with the fourth official because he knows he's getting dragged off the pitch. Look, Clyburn had just four goals and one assist, which is not amazing. But in overall play, I think he's looked pretty good. Especially in the last three months during the Cherries' upturn in form. Lads, he's become just a second player this century to score in each of the big five European leagues. And he's done that before he's even turned 25. Put some respect on Justin Clivert's name. Seventh, Aston Villa, Alex Moreno. Alex Moreno was a surprising Unai Emery signing, considering Aston Villa already had Luca Dina as left back. You know, the guy stuffing his face with £120,000 a week weekly wages. But Moreno's not even young. He's also 30 years of age. But he was a £13 million buy from Real Batiste and has been very... Very decent. He was first choice left back for the second half of last season, helping Villa go 10 league games unbeaten. Injuries are spoiled this season, but he still looked good when he's played. He netted the winner away at Brentford last month. You can tell Emery trusts him more than he does Dina, so yeah, good signing. Solid. Sixth, Luton Town, Cody Drame. If you look at this on Wikipedia, you'd be forgiven for assuming that Cody Drame's loan spell at Luton was a failure. Less than 20 games, he wasn't retained, and now the 22 year old Leeds wing back is rotting away on a disaster loan spell at Birmingham. But he was great for Luton. Rob Edwards' first signing last January. A six-month loan from Leeds. He played 19 games at right midfield. Only losing twice. He played all 120 minutes in the playoff final win over Coventry. He was great. A Luton warrior. There was an online poll where 98% of Luton fans voted for him to stay this season. I have no idea why Luton did not resign him. It's not like he was even wanted back at Ellen Road. I mean, when he saw them sign Jed Spence on loan, his heart must have sank like Susan Boyle in a swimming pool. I mean, to be fair, Spence has since turned out to be a bigger waste of time than any neighbor's episode and is weirdly now banished to Genoa. Fifth chef United McDuffie. Chris Wilder's first signing as Blades boss was a freebie signing of 30-year-old attacking midfielder Mark Duffy. Someone who, yeah, spent 10 years in the Liverpool Academy, but made his senior professional debut for Vauxhall Motors. Wow, was that just a lunchtime kick around? Was working at some car dealership? Anyway, he was a good player for the Blades, helping them win promotion from League One, was named in the PFA Team of the Year, then he helped them finish 10th in the Championship, and then helped them get promoted to the Premier League. 15 goals and 25 assists in 121 games, helping them gain promotion twice, before, yeah, a weird fail loan spells at Stoke and Adelton Hag. Well, considering he cost less than the Poison Hot Chocolate, brilliant. Buy for Wilder. Fourth Tottenham, Guglielmo Vicario. Everyone assumed Ange Postacoglu's first Spurs signing would be someone from Celtic. Now, it's funny. He has not gone near Celtic Park for players. Clearly, he never rated his former players all that much. In comes unknown Italian goalie Guglielmo Vicario from Empoli for £17 million. I will be honest. I thought this was like when they signed Pierluigi Gallini from Atalanta. And, um... Uh, that he would never play? I mean, Gallini has more Italy caps than Vicario, but no, he has played every match. Tottenham have won most of them. He's looked good. And yeah, I mean, considering nobody else was sniffing around him, then this is a very quality unearthed gem. Third, Brentford, Christian Norgard. Yeah. The first first team player that Thomas Frank bought as Brentford boss was Christian Norgard, a Danish defensive midfielder who he knew from his time as Bromby boss. But 
he, he was failing. A big dream move to Fiorentina had not worked. He was firmly stable to the bench. Manager Stefano Pioli was ignoring him as if he had a lump of poo sort of taped to his chin. So Brentford snapped him up for 2.8 million pounds in May 2019 and he's been class. He has turned around his career. Nearly 150 games for the Bees under his belt has helped him get promoted. He's into his third Premier League season, has since gotten into the Denmark team. He was recently linked to a Tottenham and he cost less than three million pounds. Incredible buy. Second, Newcastle Kieran Trippier. Let me take you back to January 2021. Eddie Howe's first transfer window. He was in a really weird puzzle. On one hand, Newcastle had just become the richest club in the world, but on the other, they were practically bottom of the league. It was so strange. Their transfer targets were so bizarre. There were paper links to Anthony Martial and Pierre Emerick Aubameyang, two men who I think Howe would have hated more than his own mother in law. Actually, yeah. I don't know, his mother-in-law might be really nice, but there was actual concrete interest in both Deli Ali and Jesse Lingard. Newcastle tried to sign both. Again, it would have been both complete disasters in St. James's Park. So in a month of absolute chaos, the fact how I was able to sign a 12 million pound deal for Atletico Madrid fullback Kieran Trippier, someone who he'd worked with at Burnley 10 years before, Amazing. Trippier has been sloppy recently, but overall, absolute class at right back. He's captain the Magpies out of a relegation scrap and into the Champions League, has played in a cup final at Wembley. He's been amazing in every aspect. He's played the best football of his career at Newcastle. I mean, come on, 18 assists from right back. He's an absolute joke. First Man City, Ilkay Gundogan. Pep Guardiola's first signing as Manchester City boss was a £20 million deal for Borussia Dortmund midfielder Ilkay Gundogan. I mean, that was just a Bundesliga signing. Gundogan was probably someone who Pep would have bought for Bayern Munich if he'd stayed long enough. I'll be honest, I thought initially he was a flop. I mean, come on, he missed 40 games of football through injury in his debut season. I thought he was a huge waste of cash. Just an injury-prone disaster who soon be flogged to Turkey. Oh, no, 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 no. This is his City legacy. 304 games played, 60 goals, and 40 assists. Just think about that. 60 goals is a joke. He only ever scored 15 goals in five seasons for Dortmund. Lads, goal scoring was not his thing. He was just a three to four goal a season player. Oh yeah, well, uh, remember that 17 goal season for Man City? Towards the end of his time at the Etihad, he was almost becoming a Frank Lampard type of player, arriving late in the box to score. Lads, scoring both goals in an FA Cup final win over Manchester United, that would have been enough. That would have cemented his legend legacy, but Captaining his team to a treble? Lifting his fifth Premier League title at Man City? He won 14 trophies with City. He's one of the greatest players in their history. And he cost the same transfer fee that Newcastle paid for Chris Wood. Ah, uh, wow! Anyway, that's the end of the Lemon Calls. What do you think? Let me know. Okay, let me know in the comments. What do you think? What was your best? Let me know. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give a lecture and subscribe. And as always, I'll talk shit in a while.